Oh, welcome. Welcome to the TD Lecture 2021. I'm Susan Phillips, professor in the School of Public Policy and Administration and graduate supervisor of the Master of Philanthropy and Nonprofit Leadership. To begin, we'd like to acknowledge that Carleton University is situated on the unceded territory of the Algonquin's people, Algonquin peoples, and recognize the many territories of Turtle Island on which we all work and reside. These territories are home to many indigenous people who have lived here for tens of thousands of years and continue to live here as settlers, immigrants, and their descendants, and as visitors. We honor and respect the many indigenous people of this land and hope for a more just and equitable future together. As part of a series of annual events, Carleton University is grateful to TD for leadership as one of the first and key supporters of the Master of Philanthropy and Nonprofit Leadership, the only graduate program of its kind in the country. As we work through our really interesting panel today, for the best viewing experience, it's preferable if you put your screen on speaker view, you can do that with a little view icon in the upper right hand corner. Philanthropy worldwide is, is undergoing transformational change. And it's true that over the centuries, philanthropy has evolved and it's experienced its own trends, its own fashions, from the, the scientific bent of the early industrials like Carnegie and Rockefeller, through more recent uh, fashions, I would argue, of strategic philanthropy that encourage philanthropists and foundations to set priorities, to pick winners, and to really grant and, and work for impact on those priorities. But the transformation that's underway now is, is more than fashion. Rather, it results from some very deep factors, a convergence of factors of our society and our economy. These include growing income inequality that raises new questions about the public responsibilities of private wealth, concerns uh, about justice of all kinds, indigenous and racial justice, climate justice, the impending transfer of wealth, and the expectation of a young generation that philanthropy can work toward greater racial and environmental justice. In short, expectations are that philanthropy can do more and it can do better. These changes that are shifting power, shifting power in significant ways and the impact that's having on philanthropy and on those it serves are what we'll, we'll explore in this session. We ask as we move from charity, grant making for the disadvantaged, an older version of philanthropy, to justice oriented philanthropy that seeks to advance a more inclusive, a more just and equitable world. We ask how is philanthropy doing and how can it do better? Before turning to our panel, it is my pleasure to invite Farah Kurji, Senior Manager of Philanthropy, Global Corporate Citizenship at TD Bank Group, to provide a welcome from TD. Farah? Thank you so much, Dr. Phillips. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Farah Kurji, and I'm the Senior Manager for Philanthropy at TD Bank Group. Uh, it is my absolute pleasure to be part of today's event on behalf of TD. At the bank, we are very proud of our support for Carleton University and the Masters of Philanthropy program. We have established great roots together, which date back to 2012, and over time, we've shaped some of the brightest minds in the sector. It is through Carleton's great work and teachings that current and future leaders are being equipped with the strategic and innovative thinking they need to heighten their work 
and create impact. I am personally thrilled about today's discussion focused on the transformation taking place within the sector. No doubt it should be a very engaging hour and a half ahead. Today, I'd like to start the session by sharing a bit more about how we are thinking about and approaching philanthropy at TV. Each day, I have the privilege of leading a small yet mighty team, which is responsible for setting and implementing the bank's philanthropic strategy across our Canadian footprint. Our philanthropy is tied to our global corporate citizenship platform, the TD Ready Commitment, which is a multi-year global initiative aspiring to help open doors to a more inclusive and sustainable tomorrow. Through our strategy, we're focusing on four key drivers we believe, when acted on together, will have the greatest impact. Financial security, vibrant planet, connected communities, and better health. And a key component of our platform is a target of 1 billion in community investments by 2030 across these areas. But to bring the TD Ready commitment to life, our aim is not only to leverage philanthropy exclusively, we also recognize the role our business and our colleagues play in helping create the conditions needed for people to feel more confident about achieving their personal goals in a changing world. To realize this ambition, we also know we cannot act alone. It requires collaboration, ideas, and action. And if anything, the last year and a half has demonstrated a holistic approach has never been more critical both inside and outside the bank. We've all been touched in some way by COVID-19 and heightened awareness of systemic racial injustices that are affecting every facet of society. These events have impacted our families, our friends, neighbors, and communities in unimaginable ways. Through my team and our broader social impact teams in Canada and the US, we've taken a North American view to help, help address issues that are global in nature but have responded in a targeted local manner. Through ongoing conversations with community, we've been able to understand how best to direct support to opportunities that matter and to help create broad, meaningful change in our community and address real local issues. We have also worked to integrate better practices, work with our partners in new ways and bring in different perspectives and lived experiences to our work. Even in these challenging circumstances, different parts of TD have come together to address interconnected social, economic, and environmental issues that have surfaced through the pandemic. When a concerted and integrated approach is used to address these issues, philanthropy, volunteerism, mobilizing our actual business to a cause, that's when we believe the greatest impact can be achieved. It can swing doors towards shaping and realizing a more inclusive, equitable, and sustainable world. As we look towards an equitable recovery, my hope is we will be able to continue to find ways to bring an integrated approach to our work. Thank you so much for your time. I look forward to hearing more from the great lineup of speakers and panelists today. Thank you, Farrah. When we started the MPNL now almost 10 years ago, TD was one of the first to take a risk on us and we greatly appreciate that. The program is housed proudly in the School of Public Policy and Administration, Canada's oldest and largest school in this field, which is then uh, situated in a unique faculty of public affairs. We're pleased to be joined by the Dean of Public Affairs, Brenda O'Neill, to welcome you to, uh, at least virtually, Carleton University, Dean O'Neill. Thank you very much, Susan, and thank you to everyone uh, who's joining us remotely today. I'm particularly excited to welcome you all to this uh, prestigious annual lecture that's hosted by the Master of Philanthropy and Nonprofit Leadership Program, or MPNL, as we refer to it here. In 2013, Carleton took a, what I think is a very bold step to create the first and the only graduate program whose objective is to produce new generations of leaders and innovators for the philanthropic and nonprofit sector. The pandemic I think has made especially clear as already has been mentioned, the importance of this sector for society and its absence is hard, hard felt. I understand Susan was instrumental to the effort to bring MPNL to uh, Carleton 
and is one of its fiercest champions. And what a success, a success story uh, it has become as a program. And I'm especially proud that the MPNL embodies the, the values of the Faculty of Public Affairs, what it is that we think is most important in our programming and in our research. And our mission in part is to improve governance and public policy, to build better societies and stronger democracies, to inform citizenship and to address regional and global challenges. As I've started to say as the Dean, if you study at FPA, you can change the world. And the units in our faculty address these issues from a number of different perspectives, including political science, economics, public administration, public policy, international affairs, social work. We have, as Susan said, a unique faculty around the country in terms of its composition. We are unique, as is MPNL. I'm very much looking forward to tonight's session, as I'm sure is everyone who signed on. I thank you for inviting me uh, to speak even briefly. Uh, and so thanks again, Susan, back to you. Thank you, Dean O'Neill. Now my pleasure to introduce our panel of thought and action leaders who are going to talk about uh, the changes in philanthropy and how to do better. I apologize to the panelists that my introductions are very brief that don't do justice to their experience. First of all, Lee Van Akabor is the executive director of Youth Leaps, a Toronto-based group that helps improve the educational employment outcomes of Black youth. Lee Ben has served as a board member of the Laidlaw and the Catherine Donnelly Foundation and is a co-founder of the Foundation for Black Communities, which is an important addition to Canada's philanthropic sector. The unfunded report that many of you have, have seen produced by the Foundation for Black Communities in which our MPNL collaborated revealed the minuscule amount of philanthropic support that goes to black serving and black led organizations. And the Foundation for Black Communities is taking an innovative approach that's a community first, truly shift the power and realize the agency of black communities. And we're pleased to be collaborating with the foundation on a student capstone project. Our second panelist is Joanna Kerr, president and CEO of Make Way, a national charity that builds partnerships and solutions to help nature and communities thrive together, and serves as co-chair of the board of the Equality Fund, Canada's global fund for women and girls. Prior to joining Make Way, Joanna was executive director of Greenpeace Canada, has had extensive international experience and continues to be involved in a variety of change circles for more inclusive philanthropy and society. And third, Chris Perry is social innovator and a change maker based in Montreal with a passion for environmental justice and community building. Kristen is project manager, urban agriculture and food that promotes food security in Montreal. Kristen is also a member of the leadership team for Resource Movement that organizes young people with class privilege for more just and equitable world, including advancing social justice philanthropy. Thank you all for joining us. We've asked each of our panelists to speak for a ridiculously short period of time. Uh, we'll then have a discussion with them open uh, the conversation to the audience. So we encourage you to put your questions into the chat and our technical team uh, will uh, read them out as we move to the question and answer period. And then we'll do a quick wrap up. So in alphabetical order, uh, Lee Van, do you wanna kick us off please? Sure, um, before I begin, I, I, I want to, um... I want to thank you, Dr. Phillips, for the invitation. Thank you to Carlton. Thank you to uh, TD um, Bank for this, uh, this really important platform. I'm also really happy to be able to share this space with Joanna and Kristen, and I'm looking forward um, uh, to the discussion to follow. 
for the benefit of everyone not watching me read my notes because I didn't memorize them, I'm just going to go, <laughs> I'm going to be looking off screen, so please bear with me. I'm going to spend the, the majority of my, my sort of this time I have to talk about, you know, a question or maybe to interrogate whether or not philanthropy is in fact changing and uh, to what degree. So with that said, I, I do believe Canadian philanthropy is changing. I have no doubt about it. But depending on who you ask, you might hear conflicting reactions to this transformation. On the one hand, some argue that we're moving too rapidly and altering too much, while others argue that the changes are insufficient to produce a more equitable sector that so many of us are demanding. So what's the cause of this dissonance in our sector? Well, over the last 15 years as a board member, grant maker, advisor, and even grantee, I have witnessed that the issue of inequity has been a constant and puzzling problem. On the surface of it, the problem appears simple enough to solve. To eliminate inequity, we must first realign our purposes to include those communities we overlook. We must guarantee that those communities are represented in the decision-making processes. And finally, we must ensure that these communities receive the resources they need to address the challenges they face. So realign, represent, resource, then repeat. A simple enough recipe to dismantle inequity. And over the last number of years, the many, I met many folks, including board chairs, foundation CEOs, advisors and staff. And many of them seem to like this recipe, at least in theory. The hitch comes when deciding the pace at which to institute these changes. Some believe we can't change too much or change too quickly, as I mentioned earlier. They argue, first, we must gather more data, enlist the help of others. We can't go it alone. We need to establish trust. They claim it's all a necessary part of, the, of this learning journey. Seemingly, these requests appear reasonable. That is until we examine what the delay in action actually means in terms of real world issues. Often I say, riddle me this, what do you think is happening while our sector is still on this learning journey? Do folks somehow believe the unnecessary, totally avoidable despair, suffering, and devastation that so many communities are experiencing will magically take a pause? Do folks somehow believe that the depth of poverty diminishes with the anticipation of our action? Just ask the 4 million Canadians suffering food insecurity the 1.3 million children living in poverty in this country, the 2 million seniors receiving income less than the basic standard minimum, or the 235,000 Canadians experiencing homelessness today? I'm sure their answer would be a resounding no, because while we ponder as a sector, their circumstances deteriorate further and their challenges become that much more intractable. To put it charitably, this paralytic procrastination that calls for a learning journey is akin to a fire truck taking the scenic route to a, fire, to a house fire. The journey's cost is preventable human suffering, putting the lives of millions of Canadians in jeopardy all the while. That's why we must reject the irrational notion that we should not move too quickly or that incremental change is sufficient. Instead, we should be concerned about not doing enough, not moving quickly enough. We already know the issues. The litany of inequity continues to grow larger, more entrenched, and increasingly insufferable for too many Canadians across this country. Despite this, however, many of our sectoral leaders, many of whom I see in the room today, and who I think I've you know, I would say good relationships with. So I say this out of place of both love and respect, but on harsh honesty. Too many of you remain apathetic, displaying no sense of urgency, raising doubts about how serious you really are about addressing inequity in this sector. Far too often, 
these leaders want to be applauded for tinkering at the margins instead of embracing much needed wholesale reforms like significantly increasing disbursement quotas, mandating equity benchmarks to drive greater representation, strengthening investment into equity seeking groups, incorporating trust-based philanthropy as the foundation for grant making and expanding impact investment portfolios. In understanding the mainstream philanthropy's compulsion for equity happening at the speed of convenience, black, indigenous and gender diverse communities have taken the work into their own hands to increase equity by forming their own organizations, such as the Foundation for Black Communities, which I'm a part of, the Indigenous People's Resiliency Fund and the Equality Fund to address these social deficits and to drive equity across our sector. But these groups should not have to do this. Addressing inequity in philanthropy should not be the job of those who are burdened by it. It is the moral and ethical with, uh, responsibility of those in leadership positions within our sector to be leading the charge. More than that, it's our fiduciary responsibility as well given the tax treatment our sector receives. That's why we must begin to hold our sector and those in leadership to account for our poor record on equity. We must adopt the appropriate sense of urgency. We must reject incrementalism. We must demand transformation at the scale of need. And that begins, in my opinion, with substantially increasing the disbursement quota and tying it directly to increases in support and improvement of, out of outcomes for equity seeking groups. The deadline for submissions to the Finance Canada's uh, uh, call is September 30th, 2021, regarding the uh, disbursement quota. As the deadline approaches, I wanna send out one more message. I understand that the topic of disbursement quotas has become a lightning rod issue in our sector. It is nevertheless a crucial discussion. It is, in my opinion, a referendum on the sector's commitment to equity. The results of those submissions will reveal a great deal about how much philanthropy has truly transformed and whether or not it's moving in the right direction. In the course of the panel, I'm, lo I'm looking forward to sharing the stage with my colleagues to talk about some of the other things that are changing in the sector from societal behavior, attitudes around giving, as well as macroeconomic issues that I think will probably be just as profound of an impact on our sector as the pandemic has been over the next couple of years. I thank the group, I thank uh, Dr. Phillips and the team for giving me this time, and I look forward to the resuming this discussion during the panel. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lee Van. You, you've given us a great metaphor to start with the fire truck taking the scenic route. Joanna Kerr, over to you. Thanks, Dr. Phillips, and to all of uh, you at uh, Carleton University for, for hosting us and to TD Bank for your investment in this, uh, in this initiative. And to Liban to, to set the stage so powerfully. Thank you for, for doing this. And I think I'm gonna agree with, uh, with you on all of it and, and try to build on it because um, I think what I'm sensing in terms of what's happening in philanthropy is very much a reflection of the social fabric of this country, right? And we've just gone through an election and that was the most ma election I think many of us have, have seen for a long time. But you can see that, you know, as with many parts of our country or people within our communities, there are those who are wanting to contract, conserve, uh, feel secure. Uh, and that's happening in philanthropy. There are those who are, who are saying, it's time to innovate, it's time to innovate, and, and let's look inside business for innovative models for philanthropy. And also, there are those inside philanthropy who are recognizing that there are multiple intersecting crises and a sense of urgency that if we don't deal with it, our entire social fabric, in fact, the future of humanity is at stake. And so I think if there's anything that is changing uh, 
as a result of this past year and a half is that inequality has become so much more visible to so many more people. And also the fact that philanthropy and philanthropists, their wealth has grown so much in the context of COVID that there's many more eyes on philanthropy and the role that it has to play. So, um, so I think that's an opportunity and I think that's perhaps why you're also hosting this, this discussion. And, and Liban, you had ours, I have peas. Uh, we honestly, we didn't talk in advance, but, but I want to talk about power, privilege, purpose, process, place, and people. Because um, all of this that we're talking about in, 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 in order to advance an agenda that will truly tackle social justice is about shifting power. And because of those of us who have access to philanthropy, work within philanthropy, teach about philanthropy, we have a vast amount of privilege. And so we have to use that privilege to shift power. And, you know, and so, so building on the first P, it's really about purpose. What is the purpose at this moment of philanthropy? And too rarely are we actually acknowledging that there are intersecting crises that have to be tackled at the root cause. And how much of philanthropy is really going inside and underneath as to what is, you know, the root cause of racism? What is at the root cause of, of inequality, you know, and our, our economic systems that continue to reinforce uh, the haves and have nots? You know, the rapacious capitalism that is driving biodiversity crisis and obviously the climate crisis. So what do we have to do to get in there and actually tackle root cause, the system change, the, the purpose of, of our work should ultimately be to get ourselves out of business um, and to, to create the systems where care and repair for ourselves and the planet are, are, are inherent. Um, you know, I listen to so many of my, you know, feminist friends and my indigenous brothers and sisters who 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 have the visions uh, for this transformed world, but, you know, is is their purpose part of our purpose? And I think the other thing about our purpose is that we tend to get caught up in these issues issue silos, right? And and so really, if our purpose is to tackle re it, uh, root cause, we actually have to understand the interconnectedness of crises and systems and identities and people, right? We are, we are all part of nature. We are all part of the environment. We are all part of a health system and education system. We are all part of the system that is reproducing inequality. And we can't like hive off little projects or little pieces of it, we have to see them as interconnected. And yeah, I mean, as someone who used to be a grant seeker, you know, the way you'd squeeze your project into a, into a funder criteria, you know, and try to try to see if that would fit or the, and then the funder would say, look at all the amazing things that you're doing as a mission and, and just pick off, cherry pick the things that they wanted to fund. And I've been around the world and seen organizations literally brought to their knees because of projectitis, where it's funders that are funding projects and they're not seeing the organization as a whole trying to shift a system or, or, or tackle, tackle a cause. The second P I want to talk about is process, and that's uh, disbursement quota is right in there. And Lee Ban, Lee ban was, was very, very compelling. Like the process that we are encumbered with is a, a regulatory framework that is so arcane. You know, it comes from, you know, a colonial system that is, it is so desperately in need of transformation. And how do we transform it? It has to be driven by those whose communities, by community leaders who know what change needs to happen in their communities. Right. And when I talk about communities, I'm also talking about those voices inside communities that have been the most marginalized, um, whose voices are not represented in in halls of power and the the influence of the philanthropic sector of charitable laws has tended to be the most influential. 
those who are able to um, have lobbyists and to sit around tables and to define uh, policy. And we're hearing that from our colleagues that there's a huge lobby to keep the disbursement quota exactly as it is, because you know, if we if we if we stretch it any further, then what will that mean in terms of um, the longevity of of foundations? But who are they to say? Why are why are we not asking different people the questions around? endowment investments, around disbursement uh, quotas, that whole endowment perpetuity. You know, should it really be possible for a donor to restrict the use and deployment of charitable capital in perpetuity after their passing? The other process is the process within, within our foundations, within our, within our sector. We have to move to trust-based philanthropy. And so what does that look like? It's scary for a lot of folks, but that is really relinquishing a lot of that very specific project-based uh, outcome measurements that are highly constraining. We need to be able to provide core funding, multi-year core funding, so that organizations, movements, leaders who are change makers can get out of the starvation cycle and can be adaptive, flexible, because the next 10 years are gonna be so volatile if we don't have organizations that are not just resilient, because that's a dangerous word, that's like coping. We need them to be thriving and adaptive uh, to the very um, tumultuous times that we have ahead economically, climatically, socially, all the rest of it. And I'm proud to be part of the Equality Fund and, and we've come up with a set of feminist funding principles which, which very much outline um, ways in which we can drive trust-based philanthropy. And the last for me is about um, you know, place-based and people. Make Way does so much of our work listening to communities and listening and listening and listening some more. We host so many funder collaboratives where it is the community leaders who are defining the priorities, who are in, in, in circles with us learning and unlearning together as to how we can decolonize our approach, as to how we can actually drive systems change, how we can really develop communities from, from the bottom up that are understanding the integration of these issues. Um, and if we are not actually building relationship with people uh, and staying connected to people, um, we, are, we continue to sit in our ivory towers and we're not getting messy and we're not actually understanding the problems on the ground. And you know, to that point, it's 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 our responsibility um, to really help us all kind of call more in, not call people out, but call more people in. Really stay curious, not judgmental, but really inspire much more inclusive cultures of I want to say love uh, and forgiveness. But that is that that kind of culture is really going to kind of transform the ways that we need to be bold and dare I say be radical, because there's no time to take the scenic route. Thank you, Joanna. A, a lot in in those comments. Let me follow and reinforce the bands. Kristen, you've been involved in making change in a whole variety of ways, with new giving circles, with resource movement to mobilize young people in, in new ways of philanthropy. So please pick up this conversation. Thank you. Yeah, so my name is Kristen. She, her pronouns are great. Um, I'm calling in from Jojage, colonially known as Montreal. And that's stewarded by the Ganyangahaga or Mohawk Nation. And it's, of course, a home to people of many Indigenous nations who have been displaced internally in Canada. Um, so in the context of this conversation, I think it's really important to remember that 
most of the wealth that we're looking to redistribute in philanthropy has really been extracted um, on and from the land that Indigenous people have been stewarding and are continuing to steward and inhabit for generations. And of course, it's also been using the labor of Black and other people of color. So when you think about social justice philanthropy, I really think that reparations and reconciliation need to be centered. Um, you know, those injustices should absolutely be considered as we're working to address the root causes of anti-Black and anti-Indigenous systems, um, especially when we're talking about philanthropy and social justice as a whole. So I just wanted to, to frame that at the beginning um, before I do a little intro. So I'm coming actually from an organizing context, and I also work in a small food justice nonprofit, as, as was already mentioned, so that's kind of where I'm coming from. Um, I've also managed grant giving in student associations before and started a BIPOC giving circle with friends and friends of friends this year. So I'm going to be talking, you know, more from my organizing context, not using all the language of philanthropy, although I will uh, translate some things a little bit for you. Um, I'm intentionally trying to speak more as an organizer because that's what I am. So it'll be more true. Um, I really center community care and mutual aid in my work. So some questions that I'd ask you all is who do you include in your community? Uh, what scale are you working at and why? Sometimes um, as we learn more and more about how the world is, as we meet more people, our idea of community can expand and that idea of community care therefore also expands to include more people. So I'd really invite you to reflect how you can expand your idea of community. Um, personally, I really like working at a smaller local scale and I know that every context is different. So I encourage folks to you know, share knowledge. Maybe I'll share knowledge with people in other cities, but they'll be starting their own initiatives which are similar and maybe iterate a little bit on the ones I started. And so that's a really excellent way, I think, to be adaptive over, over different scales um, without just trying to necessarily be international. For example, you can really do a lot of change at the local direct level. Um, so I encourage you to do that. Um, you know, for philanthropy, thinking about community care could just mean funding projects and movements that challenge systems of oppression and work to build safer alternatives where everyone is cared for in your community. Again, taking that really expansive definition of community. Um, so today, I only have a few minutes, so I'll try to keep it brief. I'm going to focus a little bit on the work of resource movement, so what we're doing, and some giving values from organizing for justice that could be better integrated into philanthropy, which are to some extent and are not to some extent in different, different places. So um, you can take that as you will. So I'm going to also drop a couple links in the chat as I go. Hopefully people will be able to see it. So resource, mention, re resource movement was mentioned at the beginning, and it really works to redistribute wealth, land, and power especially mobilizing youth and youth that have class and our wealth privilege. Class and wealth privilege, not exactly the same all the time. Um, and so it's an ongoing community education practice. We actually have a praxis about six sessions where people go through learning um, and unlearning about the history and ongoing impacts of racialized wealth accumulation in Canada, um, which largely of course puts wealth and social and political power in the hands of white settlers at the expense of other communities. And so it's important to know the, the nation's history when we're thinking about redistributing wealth that has been accumulated, um, recognizing our own privileges. So, you know, we can think about class, race, gender, all the different privileges we might have. And instead of, you know, feeling shame for those, we really need to use them to leverage uh, and support movement work instead of just upholding structures of oppression. And the thing about privileges is if you do nothing, you're still upholding the existing system, right? So it's something we really have to fight and it's hard sometimes if we don't recognize it ourselves. So the education part is really important in resource movement to you know, create that community where we can have a, a space to discuss and you know, encourage people to move along in their ideas and learning all together. So I feel that that's really been uh, key for me and other members of resource movement. And of course, you don't wanna just learn things and leave it there because <laughs> that would be pointless. We really wanna move towards action. So we have people doing direct giving, we might do fundraising campaigns, um, and campaigns for like a wealth tax, for example, is an ongoing one. And so resource movement is really trying to create action and create support and accountability for individuals to show up for movements in all the different ways that we can. So not just money, also showing up in person on the ground when people need us. And that's, I think, a key uh, difference between like organizing and philanthropy right now is you need to show up in person as well, not just, not just send funds if possible. So on that note, it really brings me towards the values which can help guide moving from charity to justice philanthropy. I think the key one, putting decision-making and power in the hands of those directly affected and really valuing and prioritizing different lived experiences. Often we'll have a lot of things we don't even notice because it's not our experience. And so 
really prioritizing the communities that are most affected by whatever issue you're trying to fight. Again, they're very interlocked, as Joanna was saying. So one issue is going to tie right into all the other ones is, is crucial. And when we're thinking about philanthropy and funding movement work, we want to build relationships and solidarity. So I really think in terms of mutual aid with the pandemic, especially we saw a lot of mutual aid springing up and a lot of communities have had to do this for generations and generations because they're not being taken care of by society as a whole. So they have to take care of themselves and that's where mutual aid ideas come from. So building that trust between communities, um, you know, go at the speed of trust is, is a phrase that you could use. Really letting go of that micromanagement or control, which sometimes you might have a tendency to wanna have when we, when we are giving money somewhere and in essence share our power. Um, and building that trust means that we'll have, we'll have trust in the people that are receiving the funding so we know that it's being used in a, in a good way and we just need to trust that they know what they're doing if they know their own experiences, right? So collaborating with groups and really letting to, to share the work based on the different resources or different access that we have, the different lived experiences that we have. And learn from each other, you know, you might have some things to share, make sure you're also valuing what the other partners have to share so you can improve and iterate and make the project better over time. An important lesson for me in the past years, however, is, you know, you really want to start now, however you can, even if you're starting small and building up. Um, if you need to go slowly to build it right, that's okay, but you need to keep working hard to move things forward because, you know, everything feels really urgent, especially to communities of color, to other marginalized communities, because it is urgent for us. We need those positive systems, we need that, those people that are also going to last, so taking things a little bit slower while you're consistently moving towards a goal, um, you know, not just, you um, not just letting things go and say, oh, it'll work itself out. You have to take deliberate action to move towards your goals. Uh, and we need to do that. So it's good to take the time to listen and do things right. And you know, it helps you be less rigid if you're kind of going at a pace that you can sustain. You don't wanna be over burnt out or over busy, but um, that taking that time to do things right, but moving forward allows you to be flexible and responsive to needs for change because the context is gonna change. You know, You might learn more about the communities that you're working in or part of, um, the actual context might change. You know, the pandemic is a great example of that, but we really need to keep that flexibility um, as, we, as we move through philanthropy and organizing. Uh, also, I think thinking about all the different resources that are available to redistribute and how to share power is really important, um, especially thinking about youth donors. Often we're gonna have access to less funds in the present moment, although we know like a huge wealth transfer is gonna happen, especially from baby boomers in the, in the next, well, ongoing and continuing to, to be transferred. So if you're thinking about other ways that you can also redistribute and share funds um, and power and other act things that you have access to that can be important. So I'd invite everyone to actually write in the chat one thing other than funds that you or your organization or your fund could offer in the chat. So some examples, time, skills, services, Maybe you have political influence or connections, maybe you have social platforms, and there's all different resources that we can think about when you think about redistributing power and not just redistributing money. Well, the money part is very important, so not, not discounting that. Um, I think building relationships so allows us to see what communities need beyond just funds and be able to provide and share that access because one of the things that class privilege creates is sometimes this inability to see that the access you have is not normal, right? And so sharing access, sharing power is super important in and building relationships and um, basically reversing power structures so that we have a more um, equal and equitable chance to, to have everyone be cared for. Um, one thing I actually wanted to shout out is the Assembly of Seven Generations is currently looking for space. I'm just gonna drop an Instagram link in that chat and you know, space and land access. Of course, those have both become privatized through settler colonialism. The idea of like owning land wasn't really a thing before. So reconciliation and land back principles, we can start to apply right now, even if it's in smaller ways, like, oh, you can just like have my cottage for a weekend to be able to, to host um, an event or something. Um, so thinking about different things and I'm just linking that in the chat so people can see if they maybe could help out this group. And uh, maybe I'll just finish on this. These are pretty straightforward things, but taking barriers to receiving funding. So again, I'm thinking more about my role uh, in a community organization right now. I think it's important to give with no strings attached for whatever the group or organization needs, including really long-term commitments, because that provides stability, it allows us to plan into the future and be more strategic instead of running about creating new projects all the time, instead of just like focusing on what our core mission is. Um, of course, simpler applications and reporting requirements are part of that. And that goes hand in hand with trust and relationships. 
you're not going to need a 20 page report if you've been working with the group that you're funding because you'll know what they're doing you'll see it and you'll be part of it right so trying to trying to keep things as simple as possible so that we're not just wasting our time filling out forms and instead are actually putting our time into the mission that we're trying to create and finally um giving to what i think you call is non-qualified donees which i find strange because i think that the groups that are usually considered non-qualified donees are the most qualified to be addressing issues of injustice. You know, they're usually grassroots groups that are part of affected communities and directly working to uplift themselves. So again, I don't work in philanthropy, but I'm gonna share what I found are some awesome resources on working within the current legislative constraints that exist um, from the Philanthropic Foundations of Canada. And so that's in the chat. And then the Justice Fund is actually working to change the context that we're working in. And maybe I'll just finish on those couple of resources. I really look forward to the discussion and I hope that we'll be able to move forward on things together. Thank you. Thank you, Kristen. Lots, lots to, to think about and, and action there. You've all given us some really deep food for thought. Uh, visions, the R's and P's about not being judgmental, leverage, and gave us a variety of action steps. And assuming a lot of people in our audience or who may watch this later really are well-intended, they want to do the right thing. They want to move philanthropy forward in the ways that we've talked about. What practical advice, where, where do they start? How do they break in? Of all of, all of the things that, that need to be done, for someone who wants to move in, in addressing some of the inequities through their own giving or through their own foundation? Where do they start? So the question about practicalities. You, wanna, you, you, you gave us lots of ideas, but maybe there's one you wanna reinforce. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to, um, sorry, uh, did anybody want to go first? Kristen, Jonah? Go ahead. Over, over to you. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm not sure I can reduce my thinking to the idea of, you know, a practical idea for someone who wants to give on the give side. Um, I would say that, uh, I would say that the, the advent of, of the internet has made access to information so much easier. I don't think we're ever in an excuse any longer where we can say, I don't know what to do, somebody help me. A few clicks, uh, whether it's Twitter, Instagram, or your local newspaper will tell you where the needs are. And, and I would say it's best to go directly to the organizations. I don't know if we always need to go through intermediaries any longer. And this isn't, you know, I love my local United Way. I love um, the work that um, local community foundations do, but I'm not, um, I'm not convinced that those platforms are, in today's age, the best way to get resources to communities. And frankly, maybe the, uh, maybe the other question is, why do you always need to get something back in order to give something? Perhaps we shouldn't always tie our giving to a tax receipt, right? I mean, I think, I know that's probably blasphemous to say, the idea that you would give without getting 75% back right, or getting a, you know, your name on a wing somewhere. But perhaps, you know, one of the things that I believe are changing are attitudes around giving, right, more anonymous giving, giving for the sake of giving. And so I would say, you know, to Joanna's point, we need multi-year grants. We, we have to have substantial investments to treat some of these significant um, problems that our communities face. So instead of going through a, a platform, go directly to uh, you know, those who are needed. I mean, Kristen said it best. It's often those unqualified donees are the most qualified to solve these problems. We have to know who they are, right? And, uh, and so go to them directly. So I would say for practic a more practical solution would be skip the middleman, go directly to the organizations that need these resources, build relationships with them directly on a trust-based model, not, hey, if I give you this money, what reports are you going to give me? What ballot, you know, what galas will you invite me to? What will I get for it? Uh, I would say that I think maybe it's an maybe it's an uh, an unpopular, but I think a very practical solution to some of the arcane uh, constraints that Joanna mentioned. Thanks, Joanna. Kristen, do you want to pick up on that? Or 
extend? I can go quickly and then I, I, I really wanna hear what Kristen has to say. I mean, there's so many practical things. I agree with what Liban has said. For so many philanthropists, I have seen them become transformed to do this work. They've, they've basically had a, a profound experience. Right. And I, I, I agree with you, Liban, that it's all on the internet, but sometimes you actually need to just be, take a risk, get out there, ask an organization that you trust and say, I just want to sit down with folks and have real honest conversations about what's going on. And you know, organizations like ours, I'm sure many of your organizations, you can offer those opportunities for philanthropists to actually get inside the issues and, and have, see the problems close up and hear from, you know, indigenous leaders, young women, you know, black youth who are, who can name it and are experiencing it and are showing it. And, and you, have to, you have to get into that kind of relationship, right? So that's, that's one very key thing. But the other thing, if you, if you just wanna stay, you know, you wanna stay behind your screen, I do wanna go back to that kind of systems change piece. I think it's just way too easy to, you know, oh, I'll just continue to give to, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to name any charities, but something that is very, very simple. Uh, and it's very popular, but it's not necessary. It's not necessarily changing the status quo, but if you actually want to transform food systems, if you want to actually tackle uh, poverty, that's the research you can be doing in terms of who are the organizations that are driving alternative models and fund them. Right. And so, so get at who is actually the disruptors who have a systems change model and fund them in a trust based way, multi year core funding. I mean, those are, if you think about, you know, uh, racial justice in Toronto, you know, defund the police is like the number one call of. Of, of the movements, right? How much of philanthropy is actually getting behind projects to transform the police system? I don't really think anybody has stepped up. So there's a perfect example, similar to Land Back. What does that look like in terms of transforming um, the system? So it's relationships, but you also have to get under, underneath and what are the root causes and commit to that. and it's going to take many, um, and it's going to take many years. Kristen, you've been, been working with new giving circles, new models. You want to, uh, to extend that? Yeah, maybe I'll answer the question a little directly, and then I can talk about the giving circle a bit. Um, so in terms of practical advice, I think like the self-education is a good starting point. Usually, if you want to be an ally, there's a lot of resources and energy that, you know, people of color that affected communities have directly put out there to make available to you. Um, it's also very tiring to continuously be asked as a minority, like about all the problems that you're facing. And it's a lot of emotional labor, right? So if you can do that, at least initial research, that's really good before you go talk to someone. Um, however, it can be important to have real conversations with people. Um, I'd say like making sure that you have the budget set aside for that. You're paying people fairly for their time, their knowledge, their labor, um, that would be important. And actually resource move movement has a model like this because the nature of the organization is trying to think more about uh, youth with class, with class and wealth privilege. So it is multiracial, but most people are at least class privileged. And so we wanna make sure that we're really in touch with movement. So we have a panel of movement advisors in both of the main cities where you have chapters right now. So in Toronto, and in Montreal, which we will meet with regularly to, and you know, paid time, making sure we're paying them again to, to see what, what's happening, what they need support with, you know, kind of the, the landscape of movement work. Um, so, you know, a lot of us are also part of movements, so that helps us be in touch already. And I'd also encourage people to just go out to a march, go to an event, you know, it's really simple to start making those connections and it's all about relationship building. Um, and so if you just start small, that can be really important. Um, in terms of an alternative model, um, I have started a BIPOC giving circle, 
So BIPOC again, Black, Indigenous, People of Color. And, and so it's really based on mutual aid and community care. So anyone can contribute. And um, it started just with you know, myself and a couple of friends this year and something that I started a little bit more slowly, but it really focuses on resource, resource redistribution, on reparations and on sharing. And you know, we've redistributed maybe $10,000 this year, but it's a model where people are giving whatever they can per month. So it's a really a long-term commitment and trying to create more community of, of practice around this. And you know, I have people giving $3 a month, I have people giving $500 a month now. And it's really, the goal is to center the margins. So setting up or supporting programs by and for marginalized folks. And, and so we only give to groups that are by and for BIPOC and are addressing root causes and or address, addressing people's direct needs. So acknowledging that like people are in direct need right now, but also we need to fund the movements that are gonna be changing the context that is creating this in the first place. So keeping that in balance and just recognizing, you know, um, when something isn't working for us because we started this because philanthropy just wasn't something that I wanted to enter into. And, you know, there's a lot of restrictions around funds that we were talking about in legislation. And so we're just starting something that's community member to community member and like having that community around to, to build something different that works for us. And instead of, you know, having all the power concentrated in wealthy people, it's kind of trying to distribute that power. Anyone can be part of the decision-making process that's BIPOC, even if they're not contributing to the fund. Um, although most people are because they can also contribute, you know, a dollar a month if they want. And so I think an important part is like identify community needs and then create your own structures to get what you need. Or if you're not part of the community, go meet the community where they're at and prioritize what they're like, just listening, not talking all the time, just listening to what they're saying because they've probably been saying it for a long time. Yeah. Dr. Okay. Phillips, do you mind if I just add one final thought to this, to your question? Absolutely. You know, framing you. questions is so important. And, 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 and I appreciate your question around what are the practical solutions? I think we're past practical in this in this sector. I think we really need to be thinking about impractical solutions because that's where the creativity, the innovation, and more importantly, the courage comes from. And so I wanna offer a few impractical solutions to philanthropy. Number one, I wanna talk about um, resource shifting. Uh, I mentioned the Equality Fund, I mentioned the Indigenous Resiliency People's Fund, and I mentioned the Foundation for Black Communities. If we wanna talk about real systems change, what we should be thinking about is how do we take resources from where they're currently constituted to the areas where change is actually occurring, moving dollars to those who are actually, who are, who are doing their work in their communities. That to me is a really practical solution, but when it, hear, when it hits the ears of a lot of those in our sector, it becomes a very impractical solution. So I, I'm an impractical practitioner perhaps. Um, another key thing that I, that I would recommend is, um, and, you know, I think we really need to be looking at the makeup of our sector. Each one of you, when you go back to your office on Monday morning, look at who's working with you, right? Look at who's not working with you, and then set very clear targets to change that and hold yourself accountable to those, right? Again, practical enough, but it's been an incredibly difficult thing to do, apparently, for our sector. And, and finally, my, my last impractical solution is can you take, can you take the, uh, the suggestions you hear from these conferences that you attend? I mean, it feels like we're just blocking off time so that we're not doing other work, but what do we actually take away from these discussions? So my practical solution is when you hear something, try to action it. And that's the gap that I'm finding. I see so many really great ideas. You know, I find these conferences are the great graveyard of good ideas because good ideas are going out there every single day, but I don't see them then being put into into practice. And I'm wondering if we're just not a sector of practice, but you know, performance or performing like we're listening, performing like we're allies, performing philanthropy, but not actually not completing it in the way that it ought to be. So those are my impractical solutions. Give, if you can't figure out what to do with the money, give it to those who can. For the last 40 years, we've had an imperfect system. We've made a lot of mistakes and I don't understand why we're all of a sudden reticent to the idea that others should have the chance to fail in the same way that you have had for the last 40 years. So those are my final comments, thank you. You, you anticipated uh, in, in at least part my, my next question and speaking as a, a scholar, I've been, been working with a, a group of international researchers uh, trying to, to 
to reinforce the, the, the research, the part that academe can play with, um, with movements to advance justice philanthropy. And justice philanthropy is being seen conceptually as, as different uh, than community-based philanthropy from the perspective it's not just justice oriented in outcomes, but it's inclusive in process in the sense of who, who is there, which goes to Levan's point about look around you at work. How do we how do we make how do we move to that more inclusive? It's not a new idea. We've been admonishing, realizing importance for years. But again, for those who who do want to to make positive change in, in who's on their board, who's on their staff, who they see as their community. Is there, uh, are there some first steps that you can, can offer that, that would be helpful guidance? Yeah, I think that's an important question. Um, a lot of the times just setting up a quota isn't gonna work because it's usually the culture of the organization which is not hospitable to marginalized communities. So a lot of times, you know, maybe we have a seat at the table, but we're not being listened to, or um, they're just, it doesn't feel like a comfortable place to, for us to be, or we're putting forward our ideas and they're being ignored and ignored and ignored as Ivan was saying. And so um, it really starts with changing the, the culture and organizing culture of the, you know, the organization or the group that you're involved with. And there's a really great document called uh, White Supremacy Culture by Tema Ukun, I believe. And maybe I can find it and link it after I'm done talking. But it goes through like some of the, the things that we maybe see as professionalism even. Like a lot of times it's, it's called professionalism, but actually it's really just exclusive ways to keep power concentrated in the hands of people who know how to act according to you know, what we've been pres prescribed. And so going through that list, for example, could really help groups see what what kind of culture are they enforcing? Is it actually a friendly place for, for people of color to be, for queer folks to be, uh, for example? And, and then changing that, that, basic, that basic culture so that we can, we can be more comfortable. And then, I mean, like with the giving circle, for example, I kind of did the opposite instead of just saying, oh, we should have more BIPOC. I just said, BIPOC are the center of this. People of color are the center of this. White people are welcome to support. Um, but we want to make sure the decision-making power stays in the hands of racialized people and for this particular um, project. So there's ways to like reverse and reset up uh, structures that are recentering people who have historically been excluded just to kind of make that a little balance a little bit more there. Um, but oftentimes you're starting with an organization that already exists and you have to like do the work to reverse what has already been put in place, which is long and hard work and good luck to you all who are trying it. And I really encourage you to, to keep going. Yeah, two things on that. Um, I, I, I talk to lots of say white leaders who are really, really struggling with this moment and ask the same question, where do I start? And, and I, I, the thing I always just, I say it's, this is the work, right? If, if, if you're not tackling inequality, in your own organization or power, you know, the way that power is concentrated in your own organization, then how are you supposed to change the world outside, right? So this is the work that we are doing so that we are embodying the ways of being and doing internally in order to um, tr transform our cultures and behaviors and the power externally. Um, and it's, it's very dangerous if it just comes down to a workshop or a policy, but it, it has to be truly embodied in everybody's culture to take on these very courageous conversations, create safe enough spaces to actually unpack some of this. And yes, and then you know, change, the, change the makeup of, of, of leadership and, and the board. And, on for for and similar to to Kristen's example at you know at Makeway, we we host many funder collaboratives. Same where Indigenous communities are at the center. They are the advisors of the fund. 
They are the determinants of the needs of the community. They are the advisors of the fund. And the funders that come into the circle, they listen and learn, and they only put money into the pot that is determined by the community as to where it will go, as opposed to coming in, listening to a bunch of folks, and then picking off the things that they want to fund. It's, 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 it's highly relational. Sometimes it's slow. Sometimes it can be very, very fast as, in ter as when we set up the, the COVID response funds, but it's really trying to flip, uh, flip power on its head. And I mean, I just invite anybody who's really struggling with, you know, white dominated institutions that are born of colonialism, that this is, this is our time to actually show how we can use our privilege to transform it and or get out of the way. And then the Foundation for Black Communities has been a leading edge of, 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 of flipping the, some of that power. Can you, you add to this? Yeah, I, I mean, I, um, the, you know, at the foundation, we're, we're proud to be, you know, conversation partners, thinking partners, conveners, collaborators with the broader philanthropic sector. You know, we're, we're willing to have conversations about both the practical ideas and the, and the more audacious ideas. But, you know, the one thing that I think we've been trying to just remind everybody is let's do our jobs, right? You know, there are only so few articles, charitable art activities that one gets approved for. One of those things is alleviation or relief of poverty, right? And I think the best way to grade our sector is to see how that's actually playing out in the lives of Canadians. Today, about one point, one out of every seven Canadians is living in poverty, right? Between 1980 to about 2000, if I'm correct, let me just look at my, my notes, uh, maybe it's 2006, you know, um, poverty, rates of poverty increased by nearly 326%, uh, 362%, excuse me, between 1980 and 2000. And that's far greater than the actual population growth in case anyone thinks it's related to increase in population. Um, and, you know, the impacts of that are so significant, right? And 73% of Canadians with high incomes reported their health as excellent. Right, compared to 47% of Canadians who said they're with the lowest incomes, who said that they had incredibly poor health. So you think about, uh, you think about, you know, how well we're doing when measured against the outcomes that are being seen in society. I don't think any of us can say that we're doing incredibly well. And that isn't to shame us. That isn't to say that we're not doing anything great. The question just is, are we meeting the need? Are we doing enough? So I want to quickly get back to the question of disbursement quota, mindful of where we are in time and not to take away from the questions you have. But this is why the disbursement quota conversation is so crucial. We cannot be thinking about minuscule incremental change when we think about the disbursement quota. We have to unlock the capital to be able to address the, the deteriorating conditions in our community. I've long said the philanthropic sector is the safety net to our safety net. And our safety net right now has a lot of holes. And so does our safety net as a philanthropic sector. And yet we have the opportunity, the means, the resources to do something, but where is the will, right? Where is the will? And we have an opportunity right now, and this is why I'm calling it a referendum on commitment to equity, increasing the disbursement rate. And as I'm going to put it out there as a figure and say to between eight to 10% would unlock the capital needed to be able to invest not only in existing programs, but build those new relationships, provide the long-term investment and resources to stabilize these equity-seeking groups and uh, the work that, uh, that, that, um, that is so needed. And I think that's when we'll see the reduction in the child poverty rates I talked about, the seniors, uh, the seniors care issues, the environment, and so much more. Like to me, I, I, I think the conversations that uh, have us thinking about deficits when we're actually in the space of abundance are very, very, very troubling. What do you think is the greatest barrier or the stumbling block to, to moving forward in the, all of the practical and impractical ways and vision ways that, with the vision you've suggested? If there's one, 
particular barrier that we need to name, acknowledge, and, and then address, what would it be? Six letters, R-A-C-I-S-M. And power likes to hold on to power. Yeah, it seems like people have pretty straightforward answers that it's just the existing systems of power which really create, um, you know, it's like we're trying to go in one direction. It keeps pulling us back in the other direction because the force is so strong and it's just everywhere and pervasive in all of our institutions. And so every step of the way, we feel like we have to fight. And of course, that takes a lot of energy and a lot of marginalized communities have been fighting forever um, and are not seeing enough change, right? And so that's why we need allies to be stepping up and taking on some of that burden and you know, you might get tired. It's hard work, but uh, we have to do it together else it's just not going to happen because the thing about power is to get more power, you usually need to have some power to start with. So um, I really believe in community power, and I think that's something that can really be uh, important on the community level. But in terms of like political and social power, you know, we can move that move <laughs> move that forward through building movements, but uh, the existing power really is is something that is hard to fight against. So if the people who are currently in positions of power able to, again, share that access, um, then that will that will be um, something that can help move us forward, hopefully. And I also think, I totally agree with what you said. I also agree that, I also um, want to name that philanthropy is built upon all these horrendous contradictions of, you know, of stolen land, stolen bodies, it's built upon, you know, rapacious capitalism that continues to fill the endowment, right? So, so here we are trying to say, so how can this product of a completely broken economic system that is essentially expected to be the, the safety net of the safety net, like it's a, Ultimately, we shouldn't have philanthropy. We, sh we should have an economic system. And most people also don't understand truly the, the role our economy, we take our economy as a given, but it was, our economic system was designed by a bunch of white men and it can be redesigned. So again, if we were to have the impractical audacity to use philanthropy to transform an economic system that would actually drive a society that takes care of one another and the planet. That's the goal. But it's, it's very nice to hold on to a system that has benefited uh, the elites that, that sit in, and those elites sit inside philanthropy. So it's, it's undoing all the contradictions and exposing all of that and saying, ultimately time is running out and we, you know, we, we, we've got to do it, right? A question I'll have for later is the recognition that change is also going to involve a young generation with different expectations. And part of that is how do we really engage people like, like Kristen, all of those who are um, of a much younger generation. I'll come back to that. I wanna see if, uh, check in with our audience and see what questions you have. Uh, so uh, Derek, do we have some questions that you've, uh, you've noted uh, that we should be addressing? Uh, we do have a question from Don McRae that follows on Joanna's point. Do we change the passive white male moneyed concept of charity to support these communities or is it a case of just doing it? Um, I'm not sure I quite understand the question, but is it, um, is it, I think, you know, well, charity as a, as a concept is essentially about white guilt. Right, it's like that. It's the it's the it's based on kind of a white savior context, and so it's we we shouldn't have this thing called the charitable sector or the charity laws. We should 
we should transform like our economic system so that we don't ultimately need it. But we we can look to so many um, models of justice funders of of you know philanthropists who've committed to spend down their endowment and to use their white, rich, potentially male privilege to, to disrupt. And, um, you know, what's the purpose of, of charity if not to pull people uh, beyond poverty and to, and, to, and to tackle inequality and all of the multiple crises that we have? So I'm not sure I quite understood the nuance of your question, but charity in and of itself as a concept has to go. Um, and we also shouldn't have nonprofits or non-governmental organizations. I mean, these are non-things. We should, you know, we should be talking about, you know, the mutual aid or solidarity sector, or you know, let's let's come up with with absolutely better names that are exciting. You know, well-being all of these things that actually inspire people uh, to, to be part of it so that we can all see a greater world for, for all of us. I, I would agree with, you know, Joanna's full sentiment, but, but I, I'm going to um, generously interpret the Hunt's question in my own way. And we absolutely are not going to change philanthropy unless we change the makeup and face of philanthropy and the makeup and face of philanthropy are white male and moneyed leaders, right? And therein lies the fundamental challenge. We can't just do it without changing those that are making the decisions. Uh, recently, in the, in, there was an article in the in, uh, Future of Good uh, that talked about how certain committees within our charitable sector are fundamentally uh, made up of white men, almost exclusively. Boards aren't that much different, right? And so the question becomes where the locus of decision-making and power are, if that is made up exclusively of one particular uh, perspective or demographic, then I don't think we should be surprised about the way that that system then behaves and then operates. So to me, we certainly need to make a difference. We need to change it. I, I, I had a conversation recently with um, a really, um, a really well-meaning organization. They put an advisory committee uh, and they may be brought black leaders, right? And it was incredible. It was the fully full list of black leaders that, and when you look, they all had CEO, managing director, ED. Interesting, right? Effectively what happened when we removed white leadership is we replaced that white leadership with black leadership that closely resembled it, right? homophily taking place, birds of a feather flocking together, not change makers, but caretakers in their place to continue to subsist and sustain this process, um, this system of, of inequity. And so I, I don't think it's simply enough to change the, the color of the hue of people. I think it's important that we think about who's also taking those seats, making sure that it's those communities that are again affected by those inequities. So to your question, Don, I absolutely think we need to change the makeup of our system at the leadership standpoint, but we need to be careful, right? Because the way that systems operate, as my colleagues, Kristen and Joanna have mentioned, is they're really good at replicating themselves, right? They adapt to new conditions to function in the same way. And so it's not only about putting an indigenous leader or a black leader, it's about putting the ones that actually have, that have connections, relationships and experiences in those communities. So. That would that's my comment there, and um, there was a there was an earlier comment that I just wanted to um, maybe I'll save it for after. But uh, thank you so much, Don, for your question. One of the things that was implied in in uh, partly in, in Joanna's response was that the charitable sector could do more to shake itself up not just in composition, but in terms of, of action and, and pressure for change. Now that, and, and we used to say they couldn't do that because the rules and advocacy were so constraining and they no longer are. What does the sector need to do to, to be itself a, a force for some of this change that might then pull 
uh, or push philanthropy uh, along with it. Joanna, you're nodding. I, uh, I mean, I, I think we all have great answers. So I'm, I, I'm wait. I want to hear Kristen, <laughs> and then I'm sure I'll agree with you. But uh, yeah, I mean, I think again, we've already talked about this a lot, but the charity model does seem pretty outdated. Um, like the language we use in Redos Movement, for example, is redistribution, because we recognize that the wealth that has been accumulated has been accumulated through disenfranchisement of other communities, and so it's not like. I'm so generous and I'm going to give you a gift just because I'm a nice person. It's no, you are owed this because I have earned this off your exploitation. And so I think that's a really important um, distinction to make with charity versus like mutual aid. And so personally, I, you can tell I don't really like the, the charity model. I do think that, um, you know, charities can always do better in all of our organiza organizations. We can do harm reduction. So you know, they're doing more good and less harm. But I think like when the fundamental premise is uh, is so backwards, it's a little bit hard to, to make that change. Um, so that's why I really support creating alternatives that are led by marginalized communities. And then, you know, people who want to and have the resources to can be supporting those. And it's again, shifting the power structures, which is a big challenge. And it takes a lot of Courage for people also to give up power that they have, whether that's you know their wealth or their influence, um, to other communities and other people. But that's the bravery that we're going to have to be we're going to have to be having to to move that forward. And a lot of the work that resource movement does again is to um, make sure that we're kind of breaking we're trying to break the chain because we are working with a lot of young people who either have access to wealth or maybe access to family foundations um, or just class privilege, and so. Um, you know, as that wealth is passed down, you kind of want to break the, the generational wealth accumulation and say, okay, this has been accumulated, we want to redistribute it back into the community and kind of break that chain where it's just getting, you know, more and more and more unequal until we can't even see the people who are at the highest levels. And so I think what Lee Ban was saying earlier too about like, not just replacing uh, wealthy white males with, you know, anyone else who's just like wealthy and just like replacing someone. Um, we want to just make sure that we're, we're doing really community-based things and we have to think about capitalism and about class and that as well. So if we're just, just creating groups of people who are class privileged, even if they're very diverse in other ways, it's not gonna be changing things the way it needs to be changed. It's really like also a working class struggle, right? So that's something that we need to keep in mind as we're moving forward is not just changing what it looks like, but changing the fundamental structure behind it. And I think that's a really important point that Lee Ben was, was bringing up earlier. And if I can just add to that, you know, in, in the environmental movement, internationally, nationally, in the feminist movement, internationally, nationally, there's a real explicit um, call to philanthropy to support movement building, right? And so that is a very, that's a very different ask of philanthropy than help us put out more policy research or help us build more shelters. It is about shifting or helping build community power. And you can build movements through uh, you know, sharing wealth and, and fundraising models, because we've seen it around the world. But I think the role of philanthropy to, to be explicit about supporting movement building and movement strengthening as key to this is, is a theory of change that we're not explicit about enough. Yeah, um, well, my comment that I'm about to make, I think stems from, uh, from your comments, Joanna, that economic systems are made and they can be reformed. Uh, our charitable sector requires us to continue to buy into a false belief that capitalism is a solution to all of our societal problems. In fact, you know, many of the earliest philanthropists that we can think about were despised the idea of public institutions, right? They hated the idea of taxes. They didn't like governments solving problems with people. What they said was, if you support my uh, ventures, my entrepreneurship, then I will be the one to provide those, uh, those supports to community. It creates reliance, right? It creates a principal client relationship 
between a very small privileged group of people and the rest of us. And so I think I, I appreciate Joanna bringing in that, that sort of class and um, sort of analysis or, or, or at least the critique of capitalism there, because I think that's the funda fundamental problem that we have to your point earlier, which is stopping us probably from transforming in the way that we'd like. Far too many of us are very happy to be the fixers of public institution problems, right? That is not our responsibility, right? We should not be willingly, willfully participate in a system that says our government cannot provide fundamental health care, essential health care. The charitable sector should do it. We cannot house our people. The charitable sector should do it. And those that are willingly wanting to do that, it's because they believe, and I won't not say anyone, I'm saying there seems to be this undercurrent that a belief that you know, governments can't be effective. And that's something that I think is a conversation for us to, to have. And so I, I think that's one of the biggest barriers, perspective and belief and what we can actually achieve as a society together if we were if supporting each other with, with mutual aid. And government is nothing really more than mutual aid, right? It's the idea of people coming to collect together, collect, sharing resources and thinking about, you know, common solutions, right? So instead of mutual aid, what we're looking is for benefactors. And so, I mean, the real, the real title of charity is, you know, it's, it's the benefactor system. And that's something we need to get away from. We are almost out of time. That was a great punchline from, from Liban. It summed up so many of the issues. Kristen and Joanna, do you want a final word each? I would just say I really encourage folks to, to continue on your, your learning and your work and make sure that you know, what you're learning is translated into actual action. I think a lot of the times we kind of like, oh, I'm just gonna think about that for a while, which is fine, but we wanna make sure that we're starting even with small steps to move things forward uh, within our organizations and within our personal lives as well. I think like being accountable can happen in both of those contexts and it should. We don't wanna divorce like our work from ourself. When I think about movement work, it's like part of everything that I do. And so I really encourage folks to, to work on, on moving forward on, you know, actions. <laughs> a lot of the things that we talked about today and hopefully some of the resources we shared were useful. Uh, thank you both to my panelists and to Dr. Phillips as well for facilitating. Joanna? I just want to say also, this was just a delight and to be part of this. And I think if people have lots of questions out there, there's lots of people who've got lots of answers, right? I, you know, nobody has to feel alone in terms of, figuring out how to how to do philanthropy in a much more transformative way that will ultimately tackle the crises that that are truly facing humanity so you know reach out to to folks who are doing this and just thank you i want to thank you dr phillips for for including us and it was a it was lovely to connect with with my co-panelists brilliant co-panelists and Lee Ben, I do owe you a last word. <laughs> I have nothing to say. Uh, thank you. Oh, well said, all of you. Thank you so much. Many of the, the things you've talked about are, are what we're trying to do in the MPNL. We're, we take a practical, an impractical, and a critical look at philanthropy. Uh, our aim is to produce leaders, change makers who are going to be part of the transformation process, who are not going to be managers of the status quo. Thank you all. Thanks to TD for hosting this. And we're happy, uh, no, no doubt, to follow up with answers to uh, the many questions that didn't get asked. So thanks to all and bye.